Well, it's a great pleasure to be back in the uh, Cambridge Union. It's been some years since I, I last uh, came here to, to, to speak to you all, but uh, it's, it's, a, uh, uh, it's always a, a daunting prospect, and it's, it's such bright minds to, to lay out one's case. But in this case, it's very simple in terms of are there freedom fighters or are uh, they terrorists? I think that it, it's, it's more complex than that. I would ask myself as to whether there are freedom fighters that strive to free countries uh, to enjoy the freedoms that we take for granted, or um, and how we differentiate those most importantly from subversive organisations. Subversive organisations which take advantage of chaos in order to set their own agenda. Now the simple fact of the matter is, uh, you know, and, and in terms of, uh, it was mentioned that I, I uh, have since leaving the army formed a company, New Century. What we tr strive to do in New Century is to uh, bring to less fortunate countries the experience that we have learned both in the West and particularly in Northern Ireland because we've been through the bitter experience of a long subversive war. And the core of what uh, we bring to the, the, the people that we mentor is quite simply that uh, when there is a dispute, there is a democratic debating way out. Now that's not always the case when you're dealing with a uh, a dictator as is happening during the Arab Spring in many countries but in the circumstances where we see groups in Chechnya and in the Middle East and in Afghanistan setting themselves up um, on their own resource they have separated themselves from being freedom fighters they are subversive organizations you'll be asking what is the difference well the difference is this that in Iraq for instance or in Afghanistan the military forces are there because they're either the forces of the, the country, democratically uh, elected nations have uh, armed forces which they uh, recruit and pay and they answer to the, the democratic nation. And international forces are there by invitation of that democratically elected country and also by dint of the fact that they're there because of international law of the United Nations. What about the subversive organizations? The interesting thing is they have no mandate they have no authority in what they do. They have no theological or doctrinal basis or ideological basis they can point to. They are self-appointed. So when they take someone's life, it is not legal. When they take someone's property, it is not legal. What they do is crime. So the subversive organizations are not terrorists, they're criminals. And they must be dealt with it within the, the, the law. Now, I would be the first to say that we mustn't give them combatant status. But often the struggle against these subversive organizations looks like warfare, but they're not combatants. And what we must strive to do where possible is treat them as the criminals they are. That means they must be afforded justice like anyone else. And killing is not the answer. It's not a war. And killing begats killing and only makes the problem deeper. And we can certainly show you in Northern Ireland that the point when the subversion there was criminalized that that we were on the road to recovery because at the same time as criminalizing the insurgency what you've got to do is offer a democratic and a negotiated settlement and a prospect but the other aspect which is real and i've seen it in northern ireland i've seen it around the world is that despite the pretense that criminal subversions can be supported by uh, contribution and by voluntary um, uh, voluntary uh, contribution fr from people who believe in it. That is a myth. The, the, the whole myth of uh, plastic buckets going around uh, pubs in New York to support the, uh, the IRA 
the myth that Middle Eastern businessmen support Al Qaeda with their finances, the myth that um, it's the money given freely as a uh, zagat in Afghanistan that supports the, it, it, it tell you, the Taliban. It's all a myth. The reality is that for a subversion to work and to sustain a subversion, in order to have the amount of money you need as quickly as you need it, the only way to get that is through crime. And criminal subversions are, are, are supported by three types of crime. Coercive crime, which is farmed crime. That's the volume crime. These are the people who don't even know that they're being farmed by the subversives. And then there's cooperative crime. These are the crimes and the criminals that the subversive organizations wouldn't like to put their name to, but it produces them a lot of money. Prostitution, child trafficking, people trafficking, um, drug running, petrol scams. And then there's what we call collaborative crime. That's crime that they'll put their name to and they own. And that's uh, things like um, laundering diesel in Northern Ireland, petrol scams in uh, stealing petrol in Iraq, drug trafficking and uh, electricity scams, false uh, rents in, in Afghanistan. And that's how they make their real money. Crime is what sustains them. And the way to attack these subversions is to attack their criminal enterprises. And when you've successfully taken control of those, then they will die. But the bottom line is that what they do is not legal. And until you can give them an opportunity to engage in the democratic process, in the process of dialogue, then there is no end to subversion. But when you give them the opportunity on one hand to make the choice of engaging in dialogue and debate, on the other hand, treating within the law and sticking rigidly and adhering very firmly to the rule of law and breaching not the law yourself, then you've got a chance of defeating a subversion. So I put it to you that there are no freedom fighters, there are only terrorists, is uh, one way of saying there is no war, there is crime, and crime must be dealt as crime within the rule of law, but with a look forward to inviting those with, uh, who feel that they have a case to bear to engage in a democratic process and a dialogue. gentlemen. I'd like to open with a quote from Ronald Reagan. These gentlemen are the moral equivalents of America's founding fathers. He went on to say that they are courageous freedom fighters and an inspiration to all those who love freedom. So that's Ronald Reagan talking about the Taliban in 1985. I think it, uh, it tells us what we already know. Point of information. Yeah, go on. He was referring to the Northern Alliance, not the Taliban. He was talking to the predecessors to the Taliban, the Mujahideen, in 1985. No. It's not equivalent. You can Sorry, no, I'm not going to take your points. <laughs> <laughs> so this tells us what we already know. Freedom fighter terrorists, they're highly subjective terms, and they're highly transient terms. Now we can let the proposition tell us what they think criminals are, what terrorists are. And I will let the proposition tell us what it is they think this debate is about. But I'm going to say this debate is not about criminals. It's not about the IRA. It's not about ETA. It's not about any group that will fight for political representation in countries which already grant it. But at the same time, I'm not going to insult you by standing here and saying, yes, the Taliban's bad, yes, Al Qaeda's bad, but Nelson Mandela was good. You can decide for yourselves who the freedom fighters are. But bear in mind the question, we are not debating when violence is necessary and when violence is justified. We are debating whether there are people so embattled 
and so oppressed that they fight for nothing more than their own freedom. Now the proposition will have us believe that there are no freedom fighters. Colonel Tim Collins will have us believe that there are no freedom fighters. This is a man who on the eve of the Iraq invasion said, we are going to Iraq to liberate, not to conquer. <laughs> How is that notion reconcilable with the sentiment that there are no freedom fighters? What was this liberator fighting for, if not for freedom? What makes this man so different from the Kurdish resistance fighters who fought the same enemy and who attacked the same targets and who lived under a brutal regime for 50 years? What makes this fight a different? <clears throat> Colonel Tim Collins says it's because they are criminals which seems to imply that the, uh, that the war in Iraq was legal. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, I say freedom fighters are not defined by legality. They're defined by their oppressors. Any man who fights against oppression is a freedom fighter. And that's true for a colonel in the Royal Irish Regiment. And it's true for a Kurdish terrorist fighting a ruthless, genocidal dictator in Saddam Hussein. Were it not for such terrorists, were it not for insurgencies, were it not for the Polish resistance, and the Danish resistance, and Germans themselves who undermined and who sabotaged and who, yes, attacked their own state, then the story of World War II would have been different. Because World War II wasn't won by peaceful protest. It wasn't won by democracy. It wasn't won without the help of insurgencies. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, I will concede that freedom fighters, like all men, like all women, will make mistakes. But bear in mind, it is possible to do the wrong things for the right reasons. Now take the suffragettes. Yes, they burned churches and sent death threats and blew up houses and assaulted police officers and engaged in the most horrific acts. <clears throat> but don't get caught up. Don't let your hearts be melted by stories of civilian casualties. Because there are women from this country who died for their right to vote. And the proposition couldn't name you a single innocent victim because there wasn't one, not killed. These are the freedom fighters, ladies and gentlemen. These are the men and women who have fought for freedom. These are the men and women who have died for freedom. Emiliano Zapata, 20th century leader of the Mexican Revolution, once said, Better die on my feet than live on my knees. The proposition 
would draw our attention to those who are willing to kill for what they believe in. I urge you to recognise those who have been willing to die. And I urge you to defeat this motion. against Russia, a full-scale war. And the latest attack, 
took place in Domodedovo International Airport on 24 January 2011. It was another, another suicide attack in the, 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 the most busiest airport of Moscow. Just imagine what kind of freedom they were seeking, I mean, person, these suiciders. It's the same time of suicide attackers who blown up buses here in London on 7 July. And back to the Madedovo bombing can kill at least uh, 37 people and injured some 118. Of the casualties, 31 died at the skin, prelate in hospital, and one of the route to hospital. The lives of human beings, not just, not just the statistical numbers, think about it. Russia's Federal Investigative Committee later identified the suicide bomber as a 20-year-old man from North Caucasus, who was actually influenced by extremist preachers. They also discussing, they also were discussing about freedom fight, and the result, this terrible, terrible terrorist attack. That attack was aimed first and foremost at foreign citizens, not Russians. There was one British citizen among the dead the dead, Gordon Kausland, the investment analyst, while another victim, Kirill Bodrashov, was a Russian citizen who had lived in London for several years. They were in a rush to meet uh, their families in Moscow. Well, we can find uh, further information about the official position on the issue and other appalling statistics about it in the internet. So I will permit myself another parenthetic remark about it. Our cultures, Russian and Western cultures, are different, we have no doubts about it. To understand better your world, your system of values, we have spent a lot of time in universities learning foreign languages, history and political structures. But after traveling to New York, Brown Zero in 2006, while I was in short term in Washington DC, I saw with my own eyes the terrible consequences of terrorism. Don't forget about it. I was there to pay my personal tribute to the victims of terrorism and felt a great sympathy with American people who paid with their innocent lives for some one intention for freedom fight. Well, a picture paints a thousand words. So um, I would suggest to all interested in the contemporary history of Russian politics to visit our country to talk to ordinary people, obviously not politicians or diplomats, and to draw your own conclusion on the matter we're discussing. Um, on this other house, we don't dispute that Al-Qaeda and the Taliban and the Chechen rebels are terrible. What we disagree with is that you can class all freedom fighters, like the French resistance in World War II, like the Polish resistance, the Danish resistance, or um, the groups resisting the military junta in Burma as terrorists. Can you dispute that claim? Well, I would say that... Uh, allegations about uh, the Second World War are not quite correct because the French resistance was a part to a military conflict and they were representative of the independent state that were invaded by, by foreign, foreign state, by Nazi Germans. At the same time, we had uh, Russian resistance there in uh, so-called partisans who strongly opposed uh, the invasion, the foreign invasion it was. In case of uh, terrorists, there, there wasn't invasion so in case of our country, for example, or in case of uh, Northern Ireland terrorism. There's no foreign invasion. It's the same territory, the same state. So terrorism, I would say that this is uh, it's criminals. In case they are decided to, to use the, the, the violence in their political struggle, they are not more freedom fighters. They uh, obviously have infringed the law existing in, in their country because they are citizens of that country, as it was in our case. The Chechen terrorists, they are citizens of uh, Russian Federation and they are obviously infringing the, the criminal code of Russian Federation. The same as it here in Northern Ireland and the people from IRA, they are obviously infringing the, the legislation of the United Kingdom. Uh, well, there is only one irrelevant announcement for you. I have spoken to my university mate from the Seliger Youth Forum 2011 and they are just inviting people, brilliant five people from, from Cambridge to, to participate in Seliger uh, Youth Forum 2011. Thank you very much for your attention.
Oxford University, formerly served in the British Army. He has been contracted to give expert advice to both the MOD and the US Department of Defence, and is a specialist in both British and Russian counter-terrorism. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I could begin with an anecdote. Um, I was in the army, yes, way back in uh, Northern Ireland, again, uh, back in 1988. I was posted as a corporal uh, to London Derry, Derry, for two years. Now, if you live in Ebrington Barracks in London Derry for two years, it is quite boring. You're not allowed out to go for any drinks. You, if you have no car, which I didn't, then you're stuck in a barracks for two years, uh, which isn't great fun. So me and my friends, we decided that to get out of the barracks, we'd, every now and again, we'd go for a fun run. A marathon in Belfast, a run in Macrofels, 10Ks or whatever, every weekend and certain Wednesday afternoons. We'd go out, we'd take a civilian van from the army's pool in the barracks and drive off to somewhere in the province and do a fun run and come back again. One day in 88, I couldn't go with my friends. Uh, I had a Russian A-level oral exam of all things, and my six friends went off, and they didn't come back. They were killed by a bomb underneath the van in Lisbon in 88. And that was quite a shock. Now, two days later, on patrol in, in Derry, I came across the man who gave the orders for that operation to kill my friends. Uh, he was the head of the provisional IRA in the west of the province, one Martin McGuinness. And I asked him very nicely, it's called a pee check. You stop somebody, a known terrorist on the street, terrorist, on the street, and you ask him where they're going, where they've been, and it's all very civil. And he would answer me back and say, yes, I've just been shopping. And again, it was all very civil, even though I knew this person had given the order to kill my friends. Now, we and I, as British soldiers, and this comes back to the the, the, for me, the nub of the issue between terrorist and freedom fighter. If you understand these terrorists in their own minds are freedom fighters, then you come to some understanding of how, in the end, to challenge them, to defeat them, to stop them doing what they're doing. And also, if you look upon somebody as a freedom fighter, a terror, as a free, you give them some sort of respect. And I think for the British Army in Northern Ireland, one of the reasons that Northern Ireland was in the end solved was because the British Army did have some respect for its opposition as freedom fighters. They weren't treated as out-and-out -out terrorists. They weren't shot dead on the streets. They weren't kind of gunned down. They were treated with a degree of respect. And I think that, in the end, leads to a situation whereby Martin McGuinness can today be the Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland, because there was that respect on the part of the security forces for somebody who could have been looked upon as an out-and-out -out terrorist, but in many kind of ways looked upon as a freedom fighter. And we have this dichotomy between freedom fighter and terrorist in other areas as well. We've already had heard mention of uh, Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela founded his own terrorist organisation, Ompompo Wesiswe. He was a terrorist. There were posters put up by the young conservatives at universities all across the country, including this one, in the 1980s, saying, hang Nelson Mandela, because that was the attitude towards Nelson Mandela back in the 1980s. And it was only in 2008 that the US Congress lifted uh, Nelson Mandela from its terrorist watch list. 2008. So, we, but we don't look upon Nelson Mandela as being a terrorist. We look upon him as being a freedom fighter. And this is the kind of problem. We look upon also people like Itzhak Shamir in Israel and Menachem in Begi, two out-and-out -out terrorists killing British soldiers and British civilians back in the 1940s, who became prime ministers of Israel. Yasser Arafat, again, the arch-terrorist of the 1970s, becomes the, the head of state of the Palestinian Authority. So terrorists become national leaders. And what links Nelson Mandela, Menachem Begin, and Yasser Arafat, these former terrorists, they've all won the Nobel Peace Prize. And that kind of sums up this kind of strangeness that we have. Are we looking at freedom fighters or terrorists? And my point would be that we need to understand 
that these people are, in their own minds and to their own people, freedom fighters and not terrorists. Because if you, look at, if you start using the pejorative term terrorist for your opponent, you automatically break off or cut off a level of understanding of how they operate. Osama bin Laden, obviously in the news recently, what first started him being a terrorist, I mean, he was on our side remember, back in the uh, Afghan war days against the Soviets, he was one of our good guys, part of the Mujahideen against the Soviets in the year 1980. But he became a terrorist because he objected to the fact that American Christian soldiers were based on Saudi soil, holy Saudi soil, before and during and after the first Gulf War in 1990. That's what <coughs> drove him to start attacking Western interests. Because these American soldiers had committed the cardinal sin of being present on holy Saudi soil. There was a lack of understanding on the part of the American military as to what the effect this would have. The British military, way back in the 1920s, who had control of Saudi Arabia, said then, back in the 1920s, we cannot have British soldiers on holy Saudi soil because we're just going to cause problems. The British in the 1920s controlled Saudi Arabia purely by air power. And bomb Wahhabi tribes were being a bit kind of naughty. And controlled Saudi Arabia because they understood that if you start doing things like basing your soldiers on a foreign land which is holy, then you're going to generate the idea of the freedom fighter. And I think, we, again, we come back to this idea of understanding. If we look upon our opponents as being freedom fighters and not terrorists, we're going some way to, to conducting proper, informed, and clever counter-insurgency and counter-terrorism. But if we purely look upon our opponents, or our opponents, as being just terrorists, we lose that element of understanding that is vital to con conducting proper counter-terrorism and counter-insurgency. Thank you. resistance and stuff. They had something to fight against which made them a freedom fighter, uh, whereas terrorists simply attack the population. Um, so I think it's very, been very vague the debate so far about what people believe in. I understand it is important, but I think the actions define what makes them a fighter or a terrorist. So I think, I think you're interesting.
James Matta, Trinity College. Um, I like to talk in abstention because I think the whole motion is founded on a false dichotomy, which I think the last speaker touched upon, between the idea of a freedom fighter on the one hand and a terrorist on the other hand. Um, firstly, it depends on your point of view. To a figure of authority, anyone using arms is going to be um, a terrorist. That's why Nelson Mandela was designated by the apartheid government as a terrorist. Um, I also think, as the last speaker said, that there are many examples of freedom fighters like Nelson Mandela using uh, terrorist means, um, even on a sort of global stage. Why, uh, if you want to go with the, the line that America invaded Iraq, partly as freedom fighters, um, even by their own admission, shock and awe was a sort of form of terrorism. So um, that's really all I have to say, but I think it rather defeats any, po any point in debating the motion. Vido Christ College. I don't think anyone could deny that there are people who fight for freedom. I mean, you just need to look at the Arab Spring at the moment, people in Libya and Syria 
uh, people in Yemen who are fighting for freemen. I also don't think you can deny that there are former terrorists who have reformed their ways uh, following the freedom they have gained. But to me, the question really is, can there be terrorists who are also freedom fighters? Can there be people who indiscriminately uh, cause the murder of innocents, who believe in freedom for all, who do not consider those innocents their enemies, who do, are not driven solely by a desire for freedom for their own, own people, but also by hatred for who, those who they see are their enemy? Can there be people who kill innocents elsewhere, who believe that they should be free along with them? I don't believe the Palestinians who murder innocent Jews in Israel uh, believe that the Israelis have a right to be there. I don't believe that Al-Qaeda who murder innocent people in the West believe that the West should be free as they are now. So what I ask the, the opposition to do is show that there are people fighting for freedom who do not consider the innocents they kill as their enemies who do not, do not deserve freedom. Joseph Stiles from Jesus College. Well, uh, kind of in response to Albert, I, <laughs> uh, I have a structure which uh, I think will show that there are freedom fighters who aren't terrorists, and uh, this is how I'm going to lay it out. Firstly, I think... No, I'll, I'll, I'll do it very quickly. Uh, firstly, you have to have a just cause. Um, so, yes, the suffragettes Suffragettes had a just cause. But secondly, you have to be constructive in your aim. You have to, for example, uh, want to institute a new government, you not just cause anarchy and overthrow the old one. But thirdly, and this is the important distinction between a freedom fighter and a terrorist, um, is that your methods have to be legitimate. And I don't think that means just peaceful. Um, occasionally, yes, there is legitimate violence. But the suffragettes, weren't an example of that because they attacked churches, they attacked buildings, they attacked civilian targets. Um, the IRA, if they, were if they were just targeting soldiers, maybe you could say that they were freedom fighters, but they weren't. They were targeting civilians, and that's what makes them terrorists. A freedom fighter limits it to military targets and people like that. A terrorist goes beyond that indiscriminate attacks, which will kill civilians. Jeremy Schwartz Wilson. Uh, look, um, I think that both sides are missing a glaring point in addressing this resolution. Because the key phrase is not violence or even political legitimacy or even conflating one terrorist group that becomes a freedom fighter group or one terrorist group that's negotiated. The key point that we all need to look at is this phrase, political process. The terrorist isolates and alienates himself from the political process. The freedom fighter is shut out of the political process. That's the key difference. That's what distinguishes Al-Qaeda from the Indian independence movement. That's what distinguishes the difference between the Contras and those who commit domestic ter terrorism like ETA. There is a political process. There's participation. There are rights. Spain has a legislature. It has civil liberties. Great Britain has a legislature. It has civil liberties. In the case of Al-Qaeda, they shut themselves out. In the case of the freedom fighters, such as the Contras, they were oppressed by a Sandinista regime that didn't hold free elections. In the case of the Chechens, whatever you may think of the Russian government and its leadership, their terrorism was unacceptable, especially since there was a political process in place to address their grievances. So I ask the House to vote in abstention for this motion, not because you support terrorism, or not because you support the conflation of freedom fighter and terrorism, but simply because 
The political process is the key point that both sides have ignored. Thank you. saying that throughout history there have been many just and noble causes for which people have fought and died. The struggle against slavery, the struggle against military occupation, the struggle for independence, the struggle for women's rights, the struggle for labor. There will be every day and in many parts of the world different causes that men and women will want to take up, to defend and to die for, as the gentleman on the opposition has said. The issue here is not that they die for a cause, but that they're willing to kill non-combatants in the name of that cause, to kill innocents in the name of that cause. And I think that is the issue we also need to bear in mind. It is very easy with a concept like terrorism, which is extremely ambivalent, for the lines to become blurred. But we all, on a daily basis, make moral and ethical decisions. And as far as I know, the vast majority of legal traditions and religious traditions oppose the killing of innocents. That is not to say that there isn't much in what the opposition says with which I sympathize. The causes that are espoused throughout the 20th century and into the 21st century reflect the suffering and lack of equity that exists in the international system. However, we need to be very clear that Terrorism, in the name of a just cause, still makes it terrorism. It mustn't be confused with the cause itself. For example, a cause I support wholeheartedly, that of the Palestinians, is one in which I see very clearly the theft of land, the lack of rights, the denial of rights, the denial of the right of return to the Palestinians, which I believe they ought to have. I have no problem with people opposing the right of the state of Israel to exist. I believe it is open to question whether the United Nations had a right to partition the land of another people. Now these are radical views. Do I have the right to kill and murder and maim in their name? No. Laila Khaled, an iconic terrorist of the 1970s, and the people, who, the, the Palestinians who carried out the Munich Olympics massacre, were the sons and daughters of the, of the Palestinians who lost their land, but they're still terrorists. The Jewish people who have suffered and been discriminated against and whose suffering is a blot on humanity's conscience are one thing. The terror of the Israeli state against the inhabitants of Gaza is another. 
Therefore, I ask you to differentiate very clearly between the calls and actions that, as I repeat, of killing and murder of innocents that is prohibited in religious traditions and different secular and religious ideologies worldwide. On that point? Um, but you've given an example of a cause where literally the only way that the state of Israel is going to cease to exist, there are six million people in that state. The only way that that state is going to cease to exist is if somebody murders those six million people. So you've given a really bad example of a cause where you can differentiate. That's quite an excellent example. The reason why, a reason how that state would cease to exist in its, in its uh, form today is if the Palestinians have a right to return and men and women, Jew and Muslim and Christian, have equal votes within that state, which they can call Israel or Palestine as they wish. Now, let me turn to the issue of state terrorism, which is as vile and perhaps more vile than that of non-state actors. The history of Stalinist Russia, of Nazi Germany, of Ba'athist Iraq, are examples of state terrorism. Even democratic societies and nations that love liberty and democracy have had a history of terror against others. The United States, the United States in its actions and its against the Native Americans, in its um, Acts in, uh, in, its, in, in its acts in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and so on and so forth. So the crimes that of terror are committed by non-state actors and by states as well. Uh, on that point, I think I've taken one point, so if I may carry on for now. The, the, the main issue here, the main issue here, is that terror is meant to terrorize. Terror in, in the name of whatever cause, whatever interests, if it results in the death of a human being, and which, which in a sense is about the sanctity of life. And it depends how sacred that life is to us here in terms of individuals and communities and societies. What we need to address here today is not the subtext in some ways of this motion, is not that terror, whether terrorism is right or wrong. The subtext is whether terrorism is ultimately the result of so-called freedom fighters using violence to kill innocents. I would like to point you to a region of the world from which I come from and which I know well, the Middle East, which has been engaged with one of the most notorious terrorists in the world, Osama bin Laden. That is a region that has suffered authoritarian rule throughout much of the 20th century and into this century, in which countries have populations, the majority or almost the majority of which in some cases li live on under $2 a day. Countries that have been the victim of military aggression. And for all that is said, about Islamic, so-called Islamic terrorism and Islamic radicalism, the vast majority of that region rejected the message of Osama bin Laden. They rejected it because they found it amoral. They rejected it because for the believing Muslims among them, they felt it was contrary to every precept of their religion. 
this whole issue of terrorism is being overtaken by the reality on the ground in much of the Middle East. Today, the terror of the state in Bahrain and in Syria, a very real terror, a terror that exists as we speak now via the midnight raids, the arrests that are happening on a daily basis. That is the sort of terror that is being opposed today by the real freedom fighters. Yes, I believe in freedom fighters, but it's the freedom fighters that object and oppose the use of violence. And they exist today throughout the Arab world. They exist in Uganda, in the lawyers that protested recently, and they exist in the early protests we are seeing in Vietnam. Therefore, I do believe that you can fight for causes that are just and noble. But the minute you engage or take up violence against non-combatants and innocents, you become a terrorist. Thank you very much. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, on this side of the house, we believe there are terrorists, but we also believe there are freedom fighters. We believe we can differentiate between them, and we think that that's why, on this side of the house, we're going to win. We don't dispute that Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and the Chechen rebels are, in fact, terrorists. We don't need to prove they aren't. All we need to do to win this debate is to prove that there are some groups who can be identified as freedom fighters. The speaker before me concedes this, but I'm going to expand on it. So, my speech, what am I going to do? Well, first I've got five things to talk about from the floor speech, and just to clear some things up in the debate. Then I'm going to talk about the situations that we believe you can justify these kind of acts, um, classed as terrorism in. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about collective action problems, and then I'm going to talk about, you know, why in some cases there really are no other options. So let's have a look at the floor speeches. Now, the first thing that we came across was the gentleman over there who told us that um, you can define these people by the actions they take. We think this is a very two-dimensional view of the situation at hand. We think you can differentiate between out-and-out -out murder and an act of self-defense. And we think you can apply that logic to the situation of terrorism and freedom fighters. We think there is a distinction, and just saying you killed someone, you're a terrorist, is not fair. Um, finally, uh, next I'm going to look a little bit about semantics. Now we've heard a couple of abstention points where they say, well, you know, this person says he's a terrorist, this person says he's a freedom fighter, so this whole debate is defunct. We disagree. We think there are some reasonably objective measures you can use to decide whether someone's a terrorist. I'm going to talk to them later. We accept that there is going to be a spectrum, but what we say, we don't need to differentiate the people in the middle ground, but at the either end of the polls we can say, you're definitely a terrorist, you're definitely a freedom fighter. In the middle, it's a bit messy, we're not really going to talk about that. <laughs> right, let's look at the issue of unarmed freedom fighting, because we had this from a point. A brief uh, question. Think, um, Are the 7-7 seven, seven oh, terrorists or freedom fighters? Well, the bombers yes, in we, we the UK, we, who we, bombed innocent people on they the buses. Terrorists. We are perfectly happy well, they to believed, say that they believed that they, 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 were, <laughs> they were promoting jihad. Thank you. No, I take your point, but what we say on this side of the house, it doesn't matter what these people eat. It doesn't matter whether Osama bin Laden thinks he's a freedom fighter. We don't care what they think, it's what we think, and we think we can use objective measures to assess this. So, the issue of unarmed freedom fighting, we say, yeah, that would be really nice where it's possible. We say this isn't always possible. We gave the example of uh, the Cayenne in Burma, where if they try unarmed, um, like freedom fighting, if they try pro um, protesting or anything like that, they get house arrest, they get killed, like this isn't going to work. We also give the, advance, um, the example of France in World War II. We say protests, the Nazis aren't going to listen. Like we don't think that's ever going to work. We say there are some situations where you have to use armed conflict to overcome this. Um, 
Albert finally got a point, which we think is lovely. Now, we say he tacitly concedes our case because he identifies, he says, well, you know, there are freedom fighters and there are terrorists, but can you prove that some terrorists who self-identify as freedom fighters are in fact freedom fighters? We, we, as we say before, we don't think this is our burden. We say as long as we can prove there are some freedom fighters, then the motion falls. Um, finally, Jeremy asks us all to abstain because no one has talked about the political process. We say Jeremy's jumping the gun. That's what I'm going to talk about in my speech. <laughs> so we say, wait five minutes and then don't abstain, vote opposition. So, let's have a look at what I'm going to say. So, situations where there's... I'm going to um, give you a little theoretical overview about the situations where there is no... Um, no thank you, Kieran. Um, where we are going to see these kind of um, situations where there's no political process, where you can't go about these the way that we would in the UK or somewhere lovely like that. So, theoretically, what kind of places are we talking about? We are talking about oppressive regimes. Uh, I go to John's, I'm not from King's. By oppressive regimes, I do mean places like Burma, not like England or something. I'm not a mad left. Okay, so, we are saying these people are being subjugated. They're being harassed. We think these people are being denied human rights, possibly to the extent that we have, like, massive racial segregation. Um, we give the example of, like, pretty much everywhere where this happens. Burma, the apartheid. Um, then we say, yeah, non-violent democratic avenues aren't open. There aren't free elections. There aren't fair elections. No, thank you. In some cases, there aren't even elections at all. How can these people represent their views in the other way? Protests are violently put down. We don't think they have the opportunity to act in this means. So some examples, we, they've pretty much all been brought up, up before. I'm not going to explain them at length. We say um, Vichy France and the occupation of the Wehrmacht. We say Burma. We say the apartheid. They don't need These are places where you cannot use political process to overcome um, the situation you're in. So what can they do? So we say they don't have any other options but to use conventional terrorist tactics. We say these people can't engage in head-on political process, nor can they engage in head-on, out-and-out in military conflict. Um, we, we, could the French resistance realistically tackle the entire Wehrmacht on their own? They can't take it down the, no, thank you, the Iron Fist of the Third Reich. So they have to employ guerrilla tactics, to use a token veterinary ana um, analogy, because I'm a vet student. They're not the lion of the African savannah, they're the honey badger. They follow them around, they get <laughs> their heels, and eventually they will take them down and they will get their end. So they can't win by themselves. They have to get support from both within their country and from the wider world. And this is where collective action problems come in. So what is a collective action problem? Basically we say it's quite simple. We say there are things which are beneficial when you do them in a large enough group of people like protests. However, we say that if you do them on your own, there is a substantial individual risk, which means you're probably not going to want to do them. We therefore say that what you need is um, a, a solution to these problems. We say terrorists are often, or freedom fighters, are particularly good at doing this because they act as a talisman. I, if I live in Burma, I'm not going to want to go and protest in Rangor or whatever because I'll probably get shot and killed. Like, I don't want to do that. However, if there are thousands of other people also doing it, then I stand a much better chance of getting my voice heard, getting free and fair democratic elections, and so I'm going to do it. We therefore say... On that, that point? If, um, yeah, go on then. <laughs> but you're not going to bomb a cafe, are you? You're going to attack soldiers. That's not terrorism, that's guerrilla tactics. There's a difference between guerrilla tactics attacking soldiers and terrorism blowing a up a cafe, well, blowing up a bus. We say that in many cases these things are one and the same. We, I'll talk a little bit more later about the apartheid, but we think that bombing a cafe in these situations, first of all, we don't think that the kind of freedom fighters we talk about do bomb cafes. Um, we think in the situations they do, they're usually accidental, regrettable casualties, and we think that's another hallmark of a freedom fighter, and I'm going to talk about that later. So we basically say, when you have someone like Nelson Mandela, who essentially acts as the poster boy for the anti-apartheid movement, he tries peaceful protests for however many years. He gives up. He tries small bursts of violent protests. Casualties do happen. We accept that. But they were accidental, regrettable, and collateral. We don't um, think that innocent civilian casualties undermine the legitimacy of a whole operation. We give you the example of basically every war ever. <laughs> like, there are always going to be civilian casualties that no one wanted, that were unse unforeseeable, that were accidental. That doesn't mean, like, just because we accidentally, I don't know, bombed a factory in Nazi Germany, killed a few civilians, we should call off the whole war effort. Uh, no, thank you. We think that when um, we have this kind of situation, I don't have much time left. Okay, when we have this kind of situation, we do need these people. We need the post boys. We need the Charles de Gaulle. We need the Nelson Mandela who stand up for what they believe in. Yes, they do some bad things, but we think that it's entirely justifiable because they don't have any other means of option. So, 
Like, to conclude, we basically have to ask ourselves whether violence can ever be justified. And on this house, we say there are. We say when the cause is truly just, when they don't have any kind of political process to, like, actualize their interests, when the casualties are minimized, accidental, and regrettable when they do occur. We say you can class these people as freedom fighters. You guys can keep giving us examples of all these groups that don't fit this description. We say, fine, we don't think the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, etc., etc., are freedom fighters. But we say there are freedom, there are real freedom fighters. We've given you three examples. We've given you the KN in Burma. We've given you the French resistance in Vichy France and occupied France. And we've given you Nelson Mandela's struggle in apartheid Africa. And so that's why we say there are freedom fighters. I've given you three of them, there are more. And for those reasons, we urge you to oppose the motion. Thank you.